Stargate Voyager. I think we're looking again at a lost technology. And it was this ancient apocalypse 12,800 years ago that wiped that from the human memory banks. Why were these ancient elongated skulled peoples or humanoids of Malta living underground? Now I believe we're talking prior to 9700 BC for the original construction of the Sphinx. And they were what some people have called giants, probably no more than seven to eight feet tall. And those giants have been pulled out of American mounds. Whether it's the colossal statue heads that have been unearthed, to all the strange artifacts you've been showing in the museums, to some of the strange features they seem to possess, the more I learn about the Olmec culture, uh, really the more fascinated I become. Hey, what's up everybody? Derek here for another episode with you. Thank you for tuning in. And in this episode, we're going to travel around a bit like we have the last couple of weeks. We're going to start out in Egypt. We're going to go to the Great Pyramid of Giza into the so-called King's Chamber. And we're going to look at some enigmas regarding the box or what many call the sarcophagus inside the King's Chamber. And I'm going to share something with you. And this information may cause a problem to the mainstream narrative regarding what they say this box is. Next, we're going to travel to Peru to check out one of the strangest mummified heads I've ever seen. It's elongated, but it's also a, a mummy in that it's got skin on it and very crazy features. If you're watching by video on Spotify or YouTube, you're definitely going to want to see this. And if you're uh, listening via audio, just click the link in the show notes to see these images as well. And last but not least, we're going to head to the great state of Ohio where uh, I found an 1899 report that talks about a strange skeleton that was discovered in a quarry. And if you know me, you know I love to search through the digital archives of the Library of Congress and find weird stuff. Well, I found a weird one for you. You are not going to want to miss this episode. But before we get to these exciting topics, I want to give a shameless plug for our 2024 Egypt tour coming this May, just a couple months away. The Stargate Voyager Egypt tour with myself, with fellow podcaster Nikiana Jones, and with the great Muhammad Ibrahim, one of the greatest Egypt guides on earth and uh, Egyptologist as well, as well as he's now an author of the new book, Egypt Before Written History. And if you're coming on this tour, I would recommend getting that book on Amazon so you can kind of wrap your head around the revelations that Muhammad's going to blow your mind with. This is going to be an epic tour. I'm not kidding when I tell you this will be the adventure of a lifetime. I believe with my whole heart, this is one of the best Egypt tours you could go on. I know there's millions to choose from. Ours is one of the best. Why? We have the best guide who's going to show you not the tourist traps and just the touristy stuff. He's going to show you the hidden history of Egypt that's actually gotten him in a lot of hot water because he's broken with the mainstream. You're going to see evidence of lost ancient civilizations that created the pyramids. You're going to see evidence of lost ancient technology. You're going to see the parts of sites in the, uh, again, evidence at sites that your, your normal tourists just miss, that they walk right by. We're going to see 20 plus sites, the best of all the sites in Egypt, and our adventure will culminate in an after hours private visit for two hours inside the Great Pyramid of Giza, where we're going to explore every chamber and passageway. We're going to have it all to ourselves, our group, and it's going to be unlike anything you have ever experienced before. Right now, you can still get $200 off registration. Use code EGYPT2024, all caps and together. And for more information to see the detailed itinerary and to register, go to stargatevoyagers.com slash tours. So let's jump into these topics. We're going to stay right here in Egypt. Did you know what I'm about to tell you regarding the mysterious box inside the Great Pyramid? So as you are making your way to what's considered the Holy of Holies inside the Great Pyramid, what is known as the King's Chamber, before you get to this king's chamber, you still you first must pass through what's called the antechamber. And this antechamber I could spend a whole episode on in itself. It's just this little room. Literally looks like you're in a mechanical sci-fi box. It's incredible. And it's one of the parts of the pyramid that really, I believe, pose a huge threat to the theory that the pyramid was just a tomb. 
So you go through this antechamber, which is like, again, this mechanical sci-fi room. And that leads through this little passageway into the king's chamber, or I should say the so-called king's chamber. So did you know that this passageway leading into the king's chamber is actually smaller than the so-called sarcophagus that sits within it? And a lot of you have probably seen photos of inside the king's chamber, and inside is this box. The mainstream uh, narrative will tell you this is just a sarcophagus that a pharaoh was buried inside. Again, back to the main point. The passageway inside the king's chamber is smaller than the box that sits within it. What are the implications of this? Well, as author Chris Dunn points out, this means that this rose granite box would have had to have been installed at the time the Great Pyramid was originally under construction and before the massive 70-ton ceiling beams over this chamber were put into place. So basically, this box was not added later by some pharaoh uh, who wanted to be be buried inside. This box was part of the original construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza. It was here before the ceilings were put on. Think about that. Now, again, if you're watching on Spotify or YouTube, you're going to see uh, photos and renderings, uh, 3D art of what I'm talking about here. And if you can't see it, if you're only listening on audio, click the link in the show notes to be taken to that first article where you're going to see these photos. Now, when you get up close to this box and peer inside of it, like we're going to do this May on our Egypt tour, uh, you're going to see some very interesting anomalies. You're going to see, now again, this is a rose granite box. Rose granite is some of the hardest material on earth. If you uh, look at it on the Mohs scale of hardness, M-O-H-S, the Mohs scale, diamond is like a 10. As far as hardness goes, in rose granite, it's like about a 7 or 8. So very hard stone. As you peer close at this box, guess what you see? Precision cuts drill-like holes, and microscopic vertical tool markings all over the sides of this box, which uh, appear to clearly be evidence of some ancient tool. Therefore, is this so-called sarcophagus uh, really a sarcophagus, or was it a box or a case that housed something else entirely? I mentioned uh, author Chris Dunn. I would recommend you get his book, uh, The Giza Power Plant incredible book that theorizes that the Great Pyramid is basically some kind of ancient energy generator, and that therefore this box might have been a casing that housed some sort of device inside. And to further kind of go down this road, many of you have probably heard of the Valley of the Kings. Now, we've been falsely led to believe that the Valley of the Kings are like right next to the Great Pyramids. Did you know that the Valley of the Kings is a seven-plus-hour car ride away from the Giza Pyramids. It's literally states away if it was in the U.S. It's that far. And if you Google you know, Valley of the Kings and you look at the images like you're going to see on the screen here, you're going to see how colorful it is inside the Valley of the Kings. There's hieroglyphs. There is beautiful painted artwork depictions. The The ceiling in many spots is, is painted blue and yellow and red. It's incredible color. Inside are actual sarcophaguses in the Valley of the Kings that have been confirmed where they pulled out literal mummies that were inside, wrapped. So why have no mummies or artwork depictions like have been found in the Valley of the Kings seven hours away? Why has none of that ever been found on the bare megalithic walls inside the Great Pyramids of Giza? When you compare photos of the Valley of the Kings to photos of the inside of the Great Pyramids, and in this case the Great Pyramid, the biggest one, it's a world of difference. One is colorful and one is just flat and bare. Now many explorers and researchers have wondered why a single chamber talking about the king's chamber, which housed a solitary, empty, supposed sarcophagus, would need the protection of a tremendous amount of granite masonry that surrounds it. Now, as Graham Hancock points out, in the Great Pyramid, above this so-called king's chamber, are five further chambers. You can't see them when you're inside of it. But if you could see in 3D, 
above the massive ceiling in this king's chamber are five literal further chambers that go up that were constructed with rose granite walls and beams that weigh approximately 70 tons each. Not wooden beams, granite beams, 70 tons. These beams have been elevated to a height of more than 350 feet above the ground. So how could this have been accomplished with ramps, ropes, and pulleys? As the mainstream narrative asserts, uh, when we consider the basic laws of physics, such as you can't haul a stone weighing tens of tons up a ramp that exceeds 10 degrees. Now, when you actually start to try to do these calculations to find out how long of a ramp with a 10 degree slope uh, you would need to get these 70 ton blocks 350 feet above the ground, you quickly realize that the ramp itself would have to be so long and so massive in the scale that it doesn't even make sense. The ramp itself would be an engineering feat that would take decades, if not hundreds of years, to accomplish, again, with a workforce of slaves and ramps and pulleys and all this, all this crap, if I can say. So that brings me to my final question. Was the Great Pyramid originally created to be a tomb? Uh, for a pharaoh, as we've been led to believe by the mainstream narrative, or did it have an altogether different purpose entirely? I believe it did. I'd love to know what you think. Leave me a comment below from wherever you're listening, and let me know what you think the Great Pyramid's original purpose was. Okay, let's move to Peru. So a handful of years ago, a strange mummified head was discovered. Um, many of you might know the name Brian Forster, a great researcher and YouTuber. Check his out, out his YouTube and follow him. But he's the one who broke the story years ago and I saw his photos. And so he gets all the credit for this. Um, so, and apparently he went and saw this and held it. And according to him, he's also a biologist. This very strange mummified head was unearthed by locals inside of an ancient cemetery uh, in the Paracas region of Peru. Paracas is where a lot of these strange elongated skulls come from. Again, what makes this one so unique is this is not just a skull, not just bone. It is uh, got skin on it. It's mummified. Now, apparently this was found along with four other skulls that appeared to be much more human-like than this one. Um, according to Brian, when he was allowed to observe it for approximately 30 minutes, uh, he went on record to state the following, quote, any idea that this is a fake or a made prop must be immediately dismissed. As again, I have seen it in person and I am a trained biologist, end quote. In these photos, you'll notice the gloved hand holding each head as it provides, you know, kind of a scale of a size. I believe that's actually Brian Forster's hand. But check out the different images of this. The top of the head has this incredible crease that goes through it. Was this due to cranial deformation or is this uh, natural DNA? The head is also, you know, it seems elongated in an almond-shaped way. It doesn't have a massive skull that goes back on, on some, like some of the other skulls, but it's, again, it's got this weird forehead with this crease in the middle. And then when you look at the overhead view, it's got a, it's got a crease going all the way down the center. So down the center and over the top. So it's got these strange eyes and then it comes down to almost like a snout like nose. Some might say, well, that, that's probably an animal. But when you look close, especially at the frontal view, the thing clearly has a human mouth, lips, what appears to be a tongue. And it almost looks like it might have had a nose that, that fell off. But what in the world is this? Now, you're also going to see all over this mummified head are holes. And that to me looks like insect holes. So again, the million dollar question is what in the world is this? I lean towards this being some kind of ancient hybrid. I'm on record as saying I 100% believe that uh, these naturally elongated skulls that we see in Paracas are genetic. You can go back and find some of my other podcasts where I've talked about this in depth. Uh, but in short, if you haven't been brought up to speed, there's two different kinds of skulls found in the Paracas. There is the cradle headboarded skulls where real humans were altering the shape of their skulls to look like the rulers, the ruling class. The ruling class had natural elongated skulls with all these anatomical genetic differences. 
with cranial volume that goes 30% on average larger than ours. Cradle headboarding can alter the shape of a skull, but it can't add more mass like these all have. Plus, they've got way bigger eye sockets. The, the form and magnum where the neck attaches to the head. On our skulls, it's right in the center middle of the skull. On these naturally elongated skulls, it's way at the back. So they're completely different. They're missing sagittal sutures. Those are all genetic markers. So having said all that, I believe that this too is some sort of genetic hybrid. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. Okay, and finally, we're going to head to Ohio where I'm going to read for you verbatim an 1899 report that I found by searching through the digital archives of the Library of Congress, um, where I found this crazy article. If you've been following me for any decent period of time, you know this is a, a hobby of mine, is to search through the Library of Congress. And you can do this. Anybody can do this. Just go to chroniclingamerica.loc.gov. This is a branch of the Library of Congress's digital archives where you can look for anything ancient America. You can search through ancient newspapers. You can search through ancient magazines going all the way back to like the 1700s. So I typed in my keywords and I found this article. And this was published in the Essex County Herald, October 6th, 1899. And this newspaper article was titled, quote, found a 10-foot giant's skeleton, end quote. All right, and now I will read from the article. Quote, It has recently been made public that a kind of incalculable value to science was made at a stone quarry three miles northwest of Akron, Ohio. The find consists of the skeleton of a gigantic man believed to have lived in prehistoric times and relics of a time when civilization was just beginning to dawn. In clearing away refuse, quarrymen, according to the Cleveland Plain paper, or there's a word there I can't quite make out, found the almost complete skeleton of a man. The skull was entire and the lower jawbone of such proportions as to easily fit over the outside of the jaw of the largest modern man. Vertebrae were found, as were also ribs and femurs, and the large pelvis bone, which was broken in two. It is believed the man must have been at least 10 feet in height. So it's important to point out this was written in 1899 at a much different time in America's history, obviously, before political correctness. So it's as if the author of this is writing quite uh, freely, stating this is a 10 foot giant's skeleton. And um, they're assuming that this was of a prehistoric uh, ancient person from prehistoric times when civilization was just beginning to dawn. And I say this to make the point that if this was discovered today in 2024, uh, first of all, there wouldn't even be a newspaper article written about this. This thing would disappear faster than a flash of lightning. It would be gone. You'd never hear about it. But for some reason, if there was something written about it, for some miraculous reason, it would be written as such. A skeleton was found in a quarry. You know, they'd leave out the giant part. They'd leave out the 10-foot part. There'd be no mention of prehistoric times. Instead, it would probably say this uh, was a Native American skeleton. And they would give no details, such as the lower jawbone was so massive that it could fit over the largest jaw of the modern man, right? So they were writing quite freely. Again, this was before political correctness when you could do this kind of stuff. And I need to point out, this isn't a, a solo incident. If you do a search through the, through the Library of Congress, you'll find unlimited articles like this. So again, that points to a bigger question of, why in the late 1800s and early 1900s were all of these supposed giant skeletons being discovered? And does this correlate to what the Bible says in Genesis 6, 4, and many other places about an ancient race of giants? And we're out of time today to get into all that, but I would encourage you to do some research. Um, read Genesis 6, 4, and, and just read legends of 
civilizations from all over the world, why do they speak of giants so much? From Egypt to Peru to Mexico, it's in the oral traditions, it's in the legends. And uh, frankly, it can't be ignored at this point if uh, you're being honest with yourself. So that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, hey, follow me on Instagram at Stargate Voyager or YouTube at Stargate Voyager. I'm really on all the platforms. I'm on X and I'm always pumping out uh, photos and short form video content. Would love to connect with you there if you want more than just a weekly podcast. But again, I hope you enjoyed this. And until next time, keep exploring.